Okay, so we are on chapter four, organism and population ecology and evolution. So I'm gonna try to make this video um, packed enough so that you don't feel that you need to read the textbook if you don't have time to do both. Um, but of course you can always dig into our textbook for some more info. Um, so yeah, this book starts off with uh, pictures of a bunch of rabbits in some kind of strange movie that I've never seen. Um, but it's really that idea that what happens when we throw the environment off balance, when something becomes off balance in a very jarring way. Um, <clears throat> so the story here is in 1859, um, the European rabbit was brought over from Europe to Australia and they brought it over for sport. They want something to hunt. Um, well, they got their wish because the population went crazy. There was not a lot of um, predators. So the bunnies just, I was gonna say the bunnies exploded, but that's a whole different image, isn't it? The bunny population exploded and um, they had millions, right? So they had millions to hunt. And then they went ahead and after many years, um, figured out that they could <clears throat> introduce a virus bunnies with a certain virus that would kill off some of the bunnies and like 60% um, were, were killed off. So it still isn't back to where it was before they brought the bunnies over, but <clears throat> certainly is a lot less. So there's that example that they give. Um, there's a movie called, I'm gonna try to find my video here, um, Rabbit Proof Fence and it is, okay, if you like movies where you are going to cry, hello, that was weird. Um, if you like videos where you're going to cry, um, this is the movie for you. It's actually very interesting for this time period, too, as far as kind of what's going on in um, uh, racism and protests right now and how we treat other people per their race. Um and we'll talk a little bit more about race if hopefully I remember when we when we talk about uh, humans. <clears throat> but um, in Australia, they were trying to um, kind of mate out um, the dark Aboriginal color. Um, it's just a really interesting movie. So not only does it bring up the whole idea of this rabbit-proof fence, this, uh, but it also brings up the idea of uh, when you try to eliminate. A particular race. So here's a trailer. Every Aboriginal born in this state comes under my control. These children, the half-castes, what is to happen to them? They cannot be left as they are. Our task is to take them from their primitive world and teach them right from wrong. Home for the three girls, Maud! Clever, that girl. She wants to go home. 
assure you that my men have better things to do than chase your charges all around the country. You can sleep with me tonight, I'll get you some food. The problem of half caste is not simply going to go away. If it is not dealt with now, it will fester for years to come. So, <clears throat> kind of interesting, right? Let me get rid of this. And do that. Why it said that. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. All right, I really hope this is recording properly because I feel like I'm going to do this for like several minutes and then um, it's not going to work, but whatever. Okay, so it also talks about, at least in um, my book, the idea of DDT as well. So um, DDT, so in one way you're, they're talking about how the population can change and the environment can change very um, rapidly when something's introduced that isn't supposed to be there, but there are other changes that can take place too. Um, and we're gonna look at uh, DNA changes and mutations and things of that nature. Um, but they mention in at least my edition two here about um, DDT. So DDT is a chemical that they would use to try to eliminate mosquitoes. So um, that carried malaria. So um, they would spray this DDT all around and then they just started to use it for other purposes as well to get rid of other pests. Um, let me show you real quick there. <clears throat> I forgot to bring that up. So DDT isn't used in the United States anymore, but it is used in other countries still. And and I last I heard, we actually manufacture it here and sell it. But I haven't checked that. I just had heard that somewhere. We sell it to other countries. Now these this is one of those things where. Um, it's an environmental issue, right? Um, some people will be like, oh, chemicals, so bad, you know, these could cause cancer, um, you know, we shouldn't be breathing this stuff in or having it on our skin, you know. This is kind of how they used to go through the neighborhoods, right, spraying it everywhere and then later found out it was very dangerous for wildlife and likely for humans. Um, so how... It kind of um, surfaced as being a chemical that was very bad was a biologist named Rachel Carson. Um, she actually wrote a book called Silent Spring, and right, um, and if the DDT would get into the food chain, right, so the mosquitoes and then the birds would eat the mosquitoes or the fish would eat the mosquitoes and the birds would eat the fish, um, anything that lays eggs turtles and snakes and, and birds, um, what that DDT would do is it prevented the calcification of those eggs. So the eggs would be really soft. So if mom sat on the eggs, um, it would kill the eggs. So you end up having a very geriatric population of birds, meaning older birds, geriatric. Um, and there were less and less birds. And that's why she called her book Silent Spring, because you know, less singing of the birds. So she actually, um, a lot of people were not happy with her findings. Uh, if you can imagine, the people who make DDT. Um, and then they were also using it on cropland, so the people who grow crops weren't very happy with her. Um, oftentimes, that's what happens in environmental issues. You, you find out what's happening, you find the science of it, or you say, oh no, this could lead to an oil spill, or here is this chemical. And then business, um, who profit off of whatever you're trying to stop gets very angry. That happened to her as well. So uh, she wrote this book, and so they stopped using it, but like I said, they do use it other places. Now, I was saying before that we could be very critical about that. You know, it's so bad, we shouldn't use it. But if I were living maybe in Honduras and um, malaria is something that would impact me right now, uh, rather than thinking of, me getting cancer 30 years from now, I might, and somebody said, hey, DDT is going to 
kill the mosquitoes so you won't get malaria. You know, as a mom with children or whatever, I might opt for the use of DDT because I'm thinking of the now and not the later because I want to live now. So with environmental issues, there's never just two sides. There's all these sides to environmental issues and there's no clear, oftentimes there's no clear right or wrong. It's just that you have to look at all the different players and what their values are and what they base their values on and you know why they believe what they believe you know they're stakeholders in um in the outcome of of these environmental solutions so uh it's one way to kind of touch a lot of things right there that's ddt <clears throat> okay um and that would be the ddt is something that would impact the uh, DNA, right? It, it actually impacted the DNA of those birds, and so the um, eggs were softer, not calcified. And then, oh, I think we have a picture here. What the heck? Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, I just wanted to see something. I was working with two different PowerPoints, blending them, so I wanted to make sure I had those. Um, at this, some movie they mentioned, I don't even know, you can, I think it's actually kind of silly. I should have taken that out. And there's the rabbits. Oh, and here's my link. Um, here, this is from edition two, but they talk about the shrimp that are still impacted by the BP oil spill. And I think this, uh, mutation was, uh, <clears throat> missing some eyes or something like that to the shrimp. Um, and then here you have moths from, actually these look like butterflies because I'd have to look, but, um, Moths usually their wings lay flat behind them, and butterflies they do that right up, you know, like this one. You can see this one here. So, hmm, but it's fuzzy here, so I'm not sure. Anyway, the book says it. Um, let me see. It'll drive me crazy, so I have to see now. Butterfly. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That was right. Okay, so now you know how to tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth. Right? The moth, the wings lay kind of flat on its butt. Okay, so here is what the butterfly is supposed to look like. And then here is after the DNA mutations from the Fukushima nuclear uh, spill, right? When the tsunami hit uh, the Fukushima plant, there's some uh, heavy duty mutations going on. So, um, and yeah, those kind of things can impact air, water, soil, right? Um, back in Chernobyl, gosh, I want to say that was the 80s. Um, there was a meltdown as well. And we almost had one at Three Mile Island uh, right here, I think in Pennsylvania. Um, but nuclear, anything nuclear can really alter our DNA. Big time. All right, there's the objectives. You can stop it here and look at those if you want. Uh, the cell. So remember the last chapter, we were talking about, or one of the, chapter two, I think, we were talking about um, tiny little atoms and what's in the atoms, right? Protons and neutrons. Well, now we're kind of like, okay, so you put those atoms together, what do you make? And at the end of that chapter, I do think it was chapter three, you had, oh, you make macromolecules, meaning carbohydrates and um, lipids and things like that, fat and stuff. So... So it's, the book is kind of taking you from like the smallest and then growing bigger. So now we're at the cell, and that's going to be a combination of lots of atoms, lots of different kinds of atoms. Um, okay, so you have these two major uh, um, breakdowns of a cell. And um, oh, there's another category in prokaryotes that's not mentioned here. Archaea. Archaea, I don't think it was mentioned in your book, but that's another group. Um, but there's prokaryotes and eukaryotes that are mentioned here, and we are uh, we have eukaryotic cells. Um, so the prokaryotes will be like your bacteria and stuff like that. And actually, I think I have a whole other slide on this. <clears throat> um, so one of the main things that is important for you to know is the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells um, is we have, in these cells, we have membrane-bound organelles and a membrane-bound 
nucleus. So that means it's protected by a membrane, okay? Um, whereas prokaryotic cells don't have that. They don't have membrane bound. Um, and we only share a couple things with them, like here's some rib ribosomes, I believe. Um, anyway, so we have a lot more organelles. So we're kind of, our cells are more advanced in structure, but um, you know, single cell organisms like bacteria, they have to be doing something right because they've been around longer than us. So what they have is really good metabolism. Um, they can function very well when, when um, you know, when, she, when uh, they don't have to adapt too readily as much as we have to. When we evolve, bigger systems have to change, right? When they evolve, if need be, um, less has to change for them to evolve, if that makes sense. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So the microscopic world, I love microbiology, so here's a whole slide on this. All right, so single cell, most are prokaryotes, or such as um, bacteria and archaea. Um, so they're all single celled. Um, protease and fungi, but fungi, that is a eukaryotic cell, but it can also be single celled. So fungi can be single or multi celled. So, like yeast is single celled, and um, like a mushroom is a fungus that's not single celled, it's multi celled. And there's the good and the bad. I made this for a microbiology class, and I put this slide in here. So, um, methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus so maybe you've heard of MRSA so here's a little video on MRSA I got it ready so we wouldn't have to and I don't know why this goofy thing is over here oh, it's not anymore okay and this is just so you can learn about how to protect yourself from MRSA you have to do some reading here so be ready to focus in and read So I'm going to stop right there, but that's really important right now, right? Because we're in a pandemic and they're still trying to figure out exactly where um, COVID-19 came from. But some believe it was um, because of the wet markets in uh, a town in China um, and something about bats. But I'm not sure if that's been debunked yet or not. But it's, it could be very likely that um, this particular virus jumped species that's not typical that's not usual like your dog gets a cold or you get a call a cold and your dog doesn't get it like you've been sick before and your your pet doesn't get it so it's not really super common that they jump like that but when it does it's a little scary so um they're saying MRSA probably you know jumped from livestock and then transferred that dangerous strain back to humans All right, so 
so yeah, that's that idea that um, because we uh, use antibiotics, we feed it to livestock, um, we use it on our hands, we use it in products, like when you see uh, some products where the antibiotic is built right into it. There's something called, let me put all these up. This drives me crazy. Oh, I have it that way. Um, there's something called triclosan or triclosan that it is in some of your products. They've taken it out of a lot of products now, but it's basically um, was a pesticide in a lot of hand sanitizers and uh, even some lotions and things like that. But it's a registered pesticide and um, not good for us, not good for us to absorb in. So but all of that has created these antibiotic resistant um, microbes. Uh, and methicillin, right, MRSA, that stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Methicillin, you know, that sounds like penicillin, right? It's one of the cillins. So you know that as an antibiotic. Anyway, um, <clears throat> here's some Escherichia coli. I forget what that was. Um, and Escherichia coli is just one of those prokaryotes, right? Um, that's in our guts, and I already talked about that in another video. And then this is a type of yeast, this uh, thrush. So all kinds of, um, or fungus, this type of fungus. All kinds of fungus. Fungus that we eat, like here is some a corn brand. Uh, we eat this a lot in our home. It's um, My daughter's a vegetarian, so this is uh, made from a myco, myco protein. So it's not meat. It's, it tastes, it's so similar to chicken nuggets, like even the texture. It's really cool, but it's a... Um, Kind of, a, it's related to a type of fungus. So, um, but like I said, it tastes like tastes like chicken. Uh, yeah. And then here's the multi-celled. So just some various things here. Mushrooms are multi multi-celled, but they're still um, fungus. And here's a really cool plant. It's a which one was this? The carnivorous plant that it's, I think it's a pitcher plant. Pi like a pitcher. Um, it can trap mice in it, birds, and then just like a, almost like a Venus flytrap, it like sets off these acidic juices and dissolves that animal that gets trapped in there. Just kind of a cool thing to show you the diversity of life here. And then here's my favorite little tardigrades. They're tiny, not quite microscopic. Um, uh, it says one millimeter here. So um, these are the ones that they send up into space to see how they can handle space. Some people think that maybe that's kind of how uh, life gets from one planet to another is because of like, you know, asteroids or explosions of things and then things that can travel in space and make it to the other planet um, would live. So he's super cute and uh, tardigrade, like after Doctor Who, um, what is that, TARDIS or something? I forget what it is, that thing he travels in. Anyway, all right, so um, talked a little bit about this, I think, in, the, in one of the chapters, like uh, energy transferring around the ecosystem, um, but here, photosynthesis. So this whole idea of different types of organisms take in energy in different ways, right, create energy in different ways, take in food, I ba basically, you could say. So plants and some bacteria and cyanobacteria um, algae, they're self-feeders. That means they can use the sunlight to create food, to create sugars, right? Um, autotrophs. And if you notice, oh, and then we have, um, well, let's go back to here. Uh, so you're taking in carbon dioxide, water, and then you have food, right? And then to for our cells to cellular respirate so we can get energy, we eat this part here, and then... Um, what's released when this gets broken down is oxygen, water, and um, we build this molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And we won't get into all that, but that's kind of like, it's, it's all done in the mitochondria, and that's the power pack of the cell. And um, so that's what we utilize, but it's the exact opposite of this, of photosynthesis, if you reverse it, that's cellular respiration. Then you have anaerobic cellular respiration where you don't need oxygen, okay? And actually at the very beginning of our cellular respiration in glycolysis, 
oxygen isn't used, um, but that doesn't create much energy. See these little ATPs here? It only creates a few molecules of ATP. And how this energy is spent is um, when this, so this stands for adenosine triphosphate, so tri means three. When one of the phosphates breaks off, then it's adenosine diphosphate, and then this phosphate breaks off, so that's where the energy comes from. Um, so if you just go through glycolysis, you're not getting much, but if you go through the whole process of cellular respiration, you get quite a bit, like 20-something, close to 30 units of ATP. But here is um, when you have people that are making yogurts and beers and things like that, um, they're utilizing yeast going through anaerobic cellular respiration, so they don't have to have oxygen. Um, so here you're taking, you, you know, you have to provide the yeast with some food, right? So it depends if you're making wine or whatever you're making. Um, and then you have carbon dioxide as well. Um, no, carbon dioxide is, sorry, this here, this arrow means these are the products, right? So this is the input here, and then these are the products that come out of it. So you have carbon dioxide and ATP of energy, but also ethanol, and that's where your alcohol is. So they utilize the cellular respiration of yeast to make alcohol. Whoop. All right. Um, I already talked about that. Boom. Then you have types of reproduction, asexual. So A means not, so asexual. Um, and then sexual reproduction. So don't have a video for that one, sorry. Uh, asexual reproduction is simple cell division. So it's basically one bacteria, it just clones itself. It keeps cloning itself, right? It copies itself. And it can do that very quickly. Um, and it's identical. And here you have plants can do that too. Here's a clone, right, of the plant. And then sexual reproduction, um, that's going to not only um, be a little bit more of a process involved, right? But you have you actually have such a variety of DNA, right? It's not just the clone anymore. Now you have um, all these chances for the mother and father's DNA to mix it up, and um, that that protects us. That variety of DNA, those the variety of genes we have. Um, in the big picture, protects us from different diseases um, and things like that. So, okay, mutations. Da -da. Make sure that I'm getting everything I want to get in here. Yeah. That's weird that that's must be organized a different way. So, um, now. Changes can come about just because, um, you know, when our genes mix, right, uh, you, you don't look exactly like your brother or sister, unless you're a twin, identical twin. Um, so there's already changes that can take place in, in different things expressed from our DNA. Um, there's also something called epigenetics that is really cool to look into. That actually is the idea that some of our genes get turned on and off depending on what impacts us, what we're exposed to. So um, I only learned about this in the last couple of years. But let's say you're exposed to a lot of pollution or maybe you're exposed to a ton of stress or you smoke or your diet is really terrible. All of that stuff can actually impact your genes. For a long time we thought, oh, whatever genes we have, we just, we just pass them on to our offspring, right? But now we know that what I do in my life before I have children can actually impact the genes I pass on to my children um, by turning them on and off. So, so if you haven't had kids yet, now you know, try to live as healthy of a lifestyle as you can because it really does make a difference. Um, okay, so, but a mutation is just a random change, right? And um, I think I have a picture of that in the next page. So, yeah, uh, ultraviolet light can do that. Um, chemicals can cause a mutation. So that's what that is. We'll talk about that in a second. And then phenotypes. 
so there's genotypes, and that is um, what actual genes you have going on. Uh, like you might have a gene for blue eyes and brown eyes. Okay, so you might have the gene from blue eyes from mom and the gene for brown eyes from dad. And actually, the genes for eye color aren't just uh, kind of one or the other. As you know, we have all kinds of shades of eyes, and it's not just like one or the other. But anyway, so let's say you have that. Uh, the brown gene is going to be dominant. So when I look at you, I see brown eyes. And that's the phenotype. So if I look at you and I see brown eyes, I'm like, oh, the phenotype is brown eyes. But I don't know if you have two brown-eyed parents. I don't know if you have a brown and a blue-eyed parent. That's the genotype. So the phenotype we can see. All right. This picture was in there just... These, uh, we can see purple and different shades of purple and white phenotypes. But we don't know the exact genotypes behind that. Um, and then it gets into population growth. So there's a couple patterns here. Exponential growth is basically like you have um, all kinds of resources, right? You you have everything you need to populate. So uh, none of the resources are strained. And then you, the numbers can just keep going up, 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 because you can keep having babies because you have all the resources you need. You have food and space and, um, you know, no predators, uh, whatever, you know, would get in your way of populating is not there. So exponential growth. Um, arrhythmic growth, so that's kind of a constant um, and then, right, because here you're talking about exponential growth. You're talking about, like, if I have six kids, and then my kids have six kids, and their kids have six kids, just imagine how many pe how many people. So that happens as well in other, um, other populations. Um, arrhythmic, or, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. I'm not a math person, but um, number of new individuals added at a constant. Then you have that there. I don't know quite know about that one as much. Um, population growth rate. So rate at which a population is growing expressed as a percent over time. So that's just you know what is actually happening. So you have these two theories of how it could happen, and then you actually express it in this way. What's the what's the actual growth? And there's a lot of things that can impact that. So some things that can impact that population growth, births and deaths, um, or immigration. So immigration is when people, you know, uh, not just people, but organisms come into an area, or emigration, they leave an area. So, um, you know, let's say somebody put up a bunch of, or took down a bunch of trees. Well, then you're going to have a lot of emigration of maybe birds leaving, right? Um, maybe somebody plants a bunch of trees. So now you're going to have an immigration of a bunch of certain types of birds coming. So birth rates, and it goes through this whole thing about the different definitions of birth rates and death rates and Im you know, immigration rates, emigration rates. So um, you can dig into that a little bit more if you like that. And next chapter is population, people population. So you might want to look at that a little bit. Um, and it gives this example of exponential growth. So this was a case study. Um, of the starling. So here's another example of uh, well-intended people bringing in an animal, an organism from another country. So this is the starling. And it was brought here, I think they said, because somebody wanted to bring in all the birds that Shakespeare used in his writings. I, I don't know. I guess, you know what? They didn't have cable back then. Um, so they brought them over and then they just populated. Um, and they're, you know, there's, here's this 10 years later, tens of thousands and millions, blah, blah. Um, the way you'll know a starling, uh, they don't all look exactly like this, but they'll have an iridescent, kind of that shiny color on them. Those are starlings, they're really pretty, but. So the only reason, so this is where I uh, kind of migrated, so it's everywhere. Um, they, this was the projected, like if you just uh, let them keep going, there would be, you know, tons. Um, but what happened in reality was what they didn't factor into this 
projecting how many would be or extrapolating those numbers, they didn't know that most or a good amount of starlings die within their first year. So they die before they can reproduce. So actually the numbers aren't as haunting as they could have been, right? Like not like the bunnies were. Um, survivorship curves. These are interesting. Um, when are you more likely to die, right? Um, so the, the type one survivorship curve, you're more likely to die when you're old and that's like us, right? Um, it's usually extenuating circumstances if we die young, uh, but typically we can live pretty old. And then type two is, it doesn't, you know, it's kind of the same chances of dying throughout your whole life. So some birds fit into that, like, I think they said the starling fits into that, um, whether you're young or old. Uh, so if you think about this, it's going to impact the um, population rates too, right? Um, if things will die older, then they've had a chance to reproduce, right? Although if you think about mammals, so a lot of mammals are like that. Um, mammals typically don't have a lot of babies at once, right? Um, even when you think of mice and they have like a pretty big amount, well, it's still not as much as like a frog or a fish with all those eggs. So type three, and those would fit into the type three, those ones that put a lot of energy into um, laying the eggs and, and um, you know, the babies, like numerous amounts of babies or young, and then less energy into taking care of them. Right? You don't have a lot of fish that take care of their babies or frogs. Um, whereas over here, like we put more energy into the care of, so we don't have as many at once. So kind of like where does an organism put their energy as well? Uh, fertility rates. Oh, yeah. Let's see, I wanted to say anything about this. I just read this chapter again just for fun. Um... You know, that got into, like, um, I think that's what I was kind of talking about. It depends what, at what age uh, an organism is able to reproduce. So, you know, there's some mammals that are more in danger of becoming um, extinct because if you take that long to get to a sexually mature age, then you may die before that if you have, you know, hunters and poachers coming after you. So that's kind of the, the downside of that. Um, and then rate of reproduction, like, you know, obviously like a human, as you get older, your chances to reproduce, you know, and your your body actually being able to, to do that appropriately and properly um, goes down with age. So that kind of got into that. Any specific fertility rates still? Um, you can look into that a little bit more yourself if you like. Carrying capacity. I had a picture in another book I liked much better than this. This is so boring, but whatever. Um, so carrying capacity basically is how much can that area, right, that environment um, hold of your of the type of organism that's in it. So let's say you're talking about frogs, right, and you have a pond area. Well you can keep having more baby frogs and have more and more frogs, but at some point it's going to hit that carrying capacity where the amount of resources that are available um, are going to even out with the amount of um, births and deaths. So if everything's kind of right there, the births and deaths and resources available that hit your carrying capacity. But if you grow, if there's more, um, organisms that grow past, so you have more numbers than what you what the resources can support, then you're going past your carrying capacity, and then that's when some negative things can happen. Because obviously, right, what's going to happen if I have more organisms than resources available? I'm asking you. I don't want to give you all the answers. Um, right. So, in some cases, let me see if it has the next one. Yeah. So, in some cases. Um, you know, you reach carrying capacity, kind of stay there. Others, you know, you exceed it, but then, um, you know, you some things die off. So then 
when some things die off, that gives the chance for the resources to grow again. Um, or maybe, you know, <clears throat> you were a bunch of coyotes and you ate a bunch of bunnies, so now there's not very many bunnies. So then um, some coyotes die, but now that there's not as many coyotes, now more bunnies start to live. And so then now more coyotes can come. And it's kind of this back and forth thing. And then you have where you way overshoot, right? Your carrying capacity. And then there's just, there's no chance for the resources to recoup. Um, and some people do worry about that as far as human population. What is our carrying capacity of Earth? Right? How, when will we reach um, the point where we've used too many resources for them to replenish to support human population? So some organisms do die out that way. Let's hope we're not one of them. We're not going to be because there's going to be so many good things in this class you'll learn and we'll reverse all that. Oh, do I want this one? No. forgot to take that one out. You can look at that one yourself. Okay. So things that put limits on population growth. Temperature. So just think about Chicago. It's, you know, I don't like cold weather, but I do like when the cold comes and then, you know, it kills off a lot of the bugs, right? We, so it, it, that's, that controls that population of those insects. Um, if you have really cold temperatures, like freezing for several days in a row, it'll actually reduce the amount of skunks you have in the spring because skunks go into, it's not a, called a hibernation, but it's kind of like a semi-hibernation. And really cold temperatures will kill them off, will kill some of them off. Um, and there won't be quite as many for um, the spring. Uh, so temperature, right? And here you have different fish living at different temperatures. That's their optimal temperature range, right? We have optimal temperature ranges as well. So remember this part, because when we start to talk about genetically modified organisms, when they're putting, you know, fish DNA into a strawberry, um, you know, we'll come back to the idea that certain fish can survive really cold temperatures. Is there enough space, right? And um, we're talking more about uh, not quite so much us right now, but other entities, chemicals, nutrients. So um, if there's, there's only a certain tolerance that some organisms can take if their water's polluted or um, their food source is polluted, right? Or maybe there's too many nutrients, too much uh, nitrogen in Somebody's putting too much fertilizer on the golf courses or, you know, um, in the farms. And then those particular organisms in that space, that's just too many nutrients for them and they die off. So range of tolerance for various factors determine. Him. Okay, so a habitat um, that is basically everything around an area. It's not just the living things. That's the... Uh, abiotic, right? The non-living, A means not, and the biotic organism. So I put a picture here with both abiotic and biotic organisms. So uh, look at the picture. Which ones are the living things and what is non-living, right? Some people get confused about water. Is water living or non-living? Dun dun. I won't tell you. Um, all right, and here's other factors, humidity, et cetera, temperature, and actually it's the temperature um, and the moisture, right, that are the two biggest things, because if you think of like a desert compared to, you know, like hot, but then you think of it as more hot and dry, and then you think of like the jungle being hot but moist, those are two completely different biomes, and I think we have a whole chapter about biomes, so we'll learn about that more there. Those are the biggest indicators of what the habitat's going to be like. Ecological niche, or niche, some people say. Um, that's your role in the environment, right? Um, it's kind of like my role in this class is I'm your instructor, I bring you information, I assign you things, and your role as a student is different than mine. Um, so the, the niche is what you do in that community. So like, what does an owl do, right? What does it eat? Is it, can we consider it um, 
rodent control, right? That's a niche. So it's not just where the owl lives in the tree or where it flies around to, but it's actually what does it bring to the community? What does it take to the community? What's its niche? All the interactions. And then the niche can change, right? A tadpole has a very different niche than the adult uh, frog. Okay, we're getting into my favorite stuff. Evolution and natural selection. So, species evolve. We know this. Um, and you have that whole lab on this, so I won't, hopefully won't spend too much time. Um, so what traits are passed on to the next generation, right? Um, and then if it helps, so if something that is an adaptation, um, a genetic, you know, whatever you have in your genes, if it's passed on, does it help the next generation? Um, and if it does, then they're more likely to live and pass that, those same genes, genes on. If you can get to the point of reproduction, you can pass the genes on, and that means they were beneficial genes, right? So, uh, so what is the fitness level? Most fit leave more offspring. So the, the fitness relates to how many offspring come from that organism. Their adaptation becomes more common, less fit, have fewer offspring. And then, so if you have fewer offspring, you're not going to pass on that gene to as many people. So I put this giraffe here because there was this guy, his name was Lamarck, and um, he had some ideas about her uh, heritage, um, heredity, about heredity and natural selection evolution to an extent, but mostly talking about heredity. And he thought that if you have two parents that, you know, um, like the giraffe, if you're, if the giraffes are always stretching their necks and stretching their necks to reach food and it's going to like make their neck a little longer because they're stretching their neck, um, you're going to pass those strong neck muscles on to your offspring. Um, or like if I work out and I get buff, I don't know I already am, but whatever, if I get more buff, um, and then I have children, I, you know, they might be able to get buff like me. Um, I want you to think about how that isn't exactly how things work, right? Because if that were the case, I could go and, you know, maybe go try to have her dye my hair right now red and pass red hair on to my children. Or, you know, we know that's not the case because um, let's see, you have some cultures that bind their feet to make them smaller, right? And I don't think this is much of a practice anymore because as you can see, it's been banned. But what they did was they, you know, um, small feet look dainty and, um, you know, that's, that's what they were trying to go for. And it didn't actually make their feet smaller. It just kind of crushed them in, as you can see here. And it's not like they passed on small feet genes to their children. So we know this doesn't work, right? And then there's also those um, neck rings. So it reminds me of when I, when I talk about Lamarck, Lamarck or Lamarck. Um, these women, you know, in their culture, a very long looking neck is very beautiful and every I don't know if it's every year, but they add another ring, right? Because there's a younger uh, uh, female who has less rings. But what it actually does is, because I looked into this, I just thought it was fascinating, it pushes your shoulders down. So it doesn't really make your neck longer. It just pushes your shoulders down. It's so, you know, um, bad for you. But, you know, in their culture, it's very beautiful. But we know that you're not passing on a long neck gene to the next generation or you wouldn't have to do these rings. Um, now, before we judge on this foot binding and, and rings, um, I mean, we do all kinds of things here in the United States. I'm guilty of all kinds of crazy things, you know, to try to be more beautiful, look younger, um, whatever, lotions, creams, my LED red light that I use on my face. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people go to more extremes, like having surgeries and things like that. And, you know, I can't fault any of these people for for their cultures because um, as odd as we think some of these are I mean we have things that might be even odder so 
go back here. But that is the idea that you cannot just pass on a gene like that. All right. Um, then you have Darwin. I know you know Darwin. He's one of my favorites. Um, his dad was actually a preacher, and he his dad wanted him to go to medical school. But he ended up, you know, studying um, the environment, right? Organisms. He went to the Galapagos Islands, and he brought back a bunch of samples, and he ended up getting married. Um, I wish I could find the clip I used to show. It's kind of funny because he was trying to weigh the pros and cons of marrying this one woman. And, um, you know, he's like, oh, I should never, I'll never go in a balloon or, you know, I'll never get to travel again. Or just all these, like, I guess negative things with marrying. But uh, he's like, well, better than a dog at least. And it was just kind of a little insulting. But he ended up having lots of kids with her. So, you know, they were happy. Um, so, but he studied and he really was like, he looked at the tortoises, but also the birds, the finches on the Galapagos Islands. And he's like, whoa, these are finches? These aren't exactly like the finches I've seen in other places. Why here on this island? Like, why are they so different? Like, all their beaks are very different. So he really, you know, came to the conclusion that depending on their food source, you know, their beak kind of matched that food source that they were eating. So if it was hard seeds or whatever they were eating and um, so what happens is you know you might have let me see I brought a couple things here you might have um, let's say this is some place where you could get food let's see, that's food I don't know I didn't even try this yet but, but here's food like maybe that's in a flower somewhere and if I have you know a beak let's say these are my birds let's say these are my birds beaks my bird beak, right? And let's say this bird can pick up food other places, right? I'm having a really hard time picking up food other places. But when it comes to here, I can't get that food, okay? So um, let's say that that bird mated, I don't know, mated with another one, kind of looks similar to this, and they had an offspring that was a little smaller, just because how the genes came out, right? Just the, the mix match of the genes from both mom and dad. So the bird was a little smaller, a little smaller of a beak. And so it can get in there, right? So now, um, if you happen to be born with a smaller stature, smaller beak or whatever, um, you may be able to reach a food source that other birds, right, cannot. So now, since you can eat now you're gonna to live to reproduction age and pass on that gene, right? And so then you'll have more, more and more birds that have smaller beaks, and eventually maybe this kind of plant is over on the other side of the island, and these they're having just plenty of food fine over here, and they're apart for so long that they may even become a different species. And we haven't talked about what identifies a species, but I will in a second. Um, so yeah, so here's all kinds of beaks that it could be, right? I don't know, I even brought my chopsticks. Um, but that's not how it works out. It, so if there were no need for that smaller beak, let's say, let's say that bird, um, who was born a little smaller with a smaller beak, let's say this didn't exist. Let's say, um, that being smaller, actually it ended up getting more attacked by bigger birds, but this size bird didn't get quite as attacked. So this genetic trait wouldn't be beneficial. So this guy got killed before he could even pass on those genes. So it depends where you are if a gene is actually going to be beneficial or not. Um, here's just a couple different birds. And I have a moth picture here, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So, um... Oh, it was just okay. Uh, so like a drought or a flood or any big event could really cause um, a population to change very rapidly. It's not, evolution isn't always slow. Um, in small organisms like viruses and bacteria, it changes fast. You know that because you get a new flu shot every year because flu changes. They're worried about if COVID's, um, you know, COVID-19's ability to change quickly. 
So the smaller and less complicated uh, the system is, it can, it can um, evolve pretty quickly. But even some bigger things, right? Um, droughts cause rapid evolution. So if it's pushed, you know, if it, all the birds that um, eat a certain kind of seed, if the drought basically killed all that kind of plant and there's no, none of those seeds left, well, those genes aren't going to be passed on because those birds are going to die out. So that's how we kind of shift um, what populations will look like and what speciation will look like. And speciation is when you become so different from something you veered off from that you become a different species. So I guess I should stop here and tell you. Um, so species would the, the um, definition of species is not only can those organisms mate together, but they can produce viable young. So they can produce young that can also mate and have young, right? If they're sterile, that's how we kind of say, oh no, then they, those aren't the same species, okay? And, and I, have a, I have a picture somewhere in here about a liger. So here, I'm gonna post this. I'm not gonna do it here because I feel like I'm talking a long time, but here's a very interesting study um, by Dmitry Bevelov. I'm not sure how to pronounce his Russian name. Uh, they say it in the video though. And there's a couple different videos of him. This is a newer one with an article that I am gonna link to. Um, super interesting about how uh, he studied how you can um, breed out, how you can try to domesticate foxes, try to choose the genes for friendliness, friendliness, right? Um, it's super interesting. Like. I would totally watch that video if I were you. Do it. Especially if you ever wanted to take an animal out of the wild and own it as a pet because it can be interesting. Anyway, good video. Um, okay, so mutations. You know, I'm not, all of this part here is what Pearson put together, and I'm not necessarily super crazy about it because I feel like they bounce back and forth. But anyway, I add this stuff. Um, so you, you know, obviously don't need to know this stuff over here, but when we're talking about mutations, there are different things. These are chromosomal, chromosomal mutations. So if something were to, you know, when our um, genes are copying, when our DNA is copying, it's, it's copying all the time so much that it can make a mistake. And typically, when our cells are copying, um, the mistake is corrected or the body kills the cell, right? It goes through something called apoptosis and it destroys the cell. So it doesn't, so it can't pass on those bad genes. Well, sometimes that's not the case. And you have, you know, there can be deletion, duplication, inversion, that's flipping, um, insertion, like one chromosome, you know, is inserted to another, translocation. There's all these different ways that the chromosomes can copy over wrong, and um, and that those can lead to cancer. Um, they're trying to figure out if the chromosomal changes lead to cancer or the cancer leads to the chromosomal changes. I've done some research on that a little bit, but all in all, if if the uh, mistake is allowed to copy on right? Oftentimes that's what causes, that's what cancer is, is that it, it doesn't stop copying, copy, 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 copy. And that's where, you know, a tumor will grow and stuff like that. So, um, so sometimes a mutation can lead to that. Sometimes a mutation is just a change and then you end up with a very beneficial uh, trait that might help you survive. So, um, it says here, random, only mutations that are carried in gametes, so only in your sex cells, can be passed to the next generation. So if you have a mutation in your skin cell, right, like skin cancer, um, that's not in your, uh, like if I get skin cancer like right here and I have a baby, that's not going to pass on to the baby. Um, but if I have mutations within my own uh, DNA that gets copied into my gametes, right, into my eggs, then that can be passed on. So uh, here are some 
Oh, I guess I'll show you this. I mean, you can always zip past this stuff if you want, right? You, that's, if you were in my lecture class, you would just be sitting there listening to me. But here, that is not the one I want to show you. Where are you? Well, here's the one about the foxes. So that's like a 10 minute long video. It's super cool though. Okay, and then, so many things open. It's not there, I must have closed it. No, maybe I thought I was just gonna click on it. Let's see. Let's see, shall we? So these are mutations that really do not serve the organism well. Um, that's why you don't see a lot of these mutations. You don't see a lot of animals with these mutations because it wouldn't help them attract a mate or maybe it won't help them get food. This takes forever. Oh, I wish I would have left this one because this one takes forever to load. So I was going to use a picture of the Simpsons with the, you know, the fish with the three eyes, that cartoon, but they were all copyrighted. Um, so I couldn't put it in my um, presentation. But here's a three-headed frog. So that is a definite mutation. And, you know, think, try to think about why this would not be beneficial to the frog, right? Or would it? Would you think that would actually help the frog live to reproductive age so they could pass on that mutation if it happens to be in their gametes? Two-headed cow. Now cows are domesticated anyway. Here you have, you know, I don't, I would hope they wouldn't try to mate that cow and make more of them. That's kind of a weird picture. Two-headed shark. All well, these legs on this little lamb or something. Goat. I don't know. And then... Oh, here's the three-headed frog. Duck with four legs. That picture will come up here. Two-headed snake. I'll let that load a little bit. But yeah, so just because there's a mutation doesn't mean it's going to be an adaptive change, right? So this would probably be non-adaptive. Um, and I know that because we don't see a lot of two-headed snakes out there in the wild. So... And there could be many reasons why this wouldn't help that snake. I mean, maybe it just wouldn't, maybe it'd be caught by a predator more easily because it never can agree on which way to go. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kind of making things up now. Um, I'm going to click, the, oh, I'll leave, I'll, I will give you that. Oh, that's in the, that's in the PowerPoint. So you'll see it there. Um, all right. Um, this was about, oh man. I can't remember. Oh, that's because I don't have it in mind. Oh, what was this? Oh, 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 oh. I want to mention coevolution at this point. So, um, as you can see with the birds and the beaks, and with um, even like hummingbirds or, or butterflies that have those long tongues for flowers, or um, things co evolve. So, they evolve together. Okay. So, these two. I think we're looking at what a uh, cheetah and uh, I can't remember the name of this guy, um, a hooved animal. Um, they evolve together. So the offspring of this animal here, all through generations, if genes were passed on that made an offspring a little faster, well, that that organism is going to live because it's going to be able to outrun the cheetah and that faster gene is going to be passed on. Okay. So that's why this animal has become so agile and fast and all these great genes, any genes that were adaptive and helped, um, got passed on because they were able to live till reproduction age. Right. And then, although at the same time, you know, we have cheetahs that are, adapting as well. So their adaptive traits of being very speedy and um, what they can go from like zero to 70, like X amount of minutes or something, I don't know, whatever it is, 60 seconds, I don't know. Um, and they have that tail that balances them, that long tail, you know, so maybe the tail wasn't so long at one point, but there was, you know, some babies born with a little longer of a tail, which helped them run and balance better and so they lived and ate and reproduced and so they passed on that long tail gene um so they they evolved together 
So when we're looking at those bunnies, right, and we're, um, you know, that situation in Australia where they brought over the bunny, nothing co-evolved with those bunnies, right? There weren't the predators for them. Uh, you can also take a look at Asian carp, and I'm hoping that the next chapter has talks a little bit more about invasive species because there's some really cool videos out there on invasive species. But if something doesn't evolve with the other thing, it doesn't put that evolutionary pressure on the other. And then so if you pop something new in there, it throws off the whole system. All right. Um, and then there's just different kinds of natural selection. Okay. And they do bird examples here, but I remember in another book, snail examples. So let's say you have... Uh, some snails and some have thicker shells and some have thinner shells. So let's just say the thicker shells make them slower. And so it's hard for them to get away from predators, but they have a, a thicker shell. So maybe it's hard to crack that shell. So um, it kind of depends on what kinds of predators are around of what shell is going to be more advantageous. You know, what genes are going to be passed on. Maybe there's predators that can, you know, um, so if it's a lighter shell and the snail can move a little faster, maybe it gets away from certain predators. And, but also, you know, maybe there's predators around that can crack shells or, you know, the thinner shell. So it really depends on where something's located, what are the predators in the area, what are, what are the temperatures in the area, what are the, the moisture in the area. All these have those pressures on what adaptation is going to succeed. So this kind of talks about that. You know, maybe they both succeed, maybe an average succeeds. Um, I was talking in the book about typically when it comes to birds, like I guess the biggest and the smallest birds sometimes have a hard time when there's environmental pressures, but the average size ones do pretty okay. So yeah, there's so much that goes into it. Um, here we have, oh, genetic drift is what we're looking at here. So if there's a random event, right? Um, let's say I have a very small population. So population is all the same kind of species in an area. Um, like you could have a population of Canadian geese at the College of DuPage Pond, and you can have a population of Canadian geese at the pond near your home. Same species, but just different populations. So here um, it's talking about like if you have a small population and some random event happens where you know, something comes along and eats a bunch of them and it happens to eat mostly all the yellow ones, then this population is not going to pass on a lot of yellow gene because a lot of the yellow ones got eaten. So then the next generation is just going to be, you know, a little different of a gene pool than the previous generation. But it says if it's a huge population, right, and something comes along and eats the same amount of yellow uh, ladybird bugs or whatever they're called. Um, we just call them ladybugs, but I think they were calling them ladybird bugs. Um, you know, it snatches the same amount of yellow ones. It's such a big population, it's not really going to have much of a difference in the next generation. So that kind of talks about that. Then founder effect is, you know, if you have a small group that leaves and, and kind of starts its own thing, you know, it, it, uh, it's the founder of a new area, um, it brings with it just that small amount of genes, and so that can be some changes. These are all just ways to influence natural selection and evolution, etc. cetera. Um, oh, here's the definition of species. I swear, that comes really late in the PowerPoint. And then there are things that there's reproductive um, isolation. So there's different ways that even if a species could hook up, and have viable offspring, right? Um, if two different species could, typically in nature, it's it's they're kind of kept apart anyway. Okay, so um, breeding barriers. So here you have you could have mountain or river in between. So even though maybe these two squirrels, if they did get together, they could have babies that you know. Um, uh, could be, you know, non-sterile, and, and so you would think it's the same species. But they're different because if there's something over here, let, let's say these black squirrels over here, um, if you've ever seen them, they're really cool looking, they 
blend into their environment better because maybe there's a lot of woods and there's a lot of shadows so the darkness actually helps them blend so they don't get eaten by predators whereas these lighter squirrels over here they're more like in an open prairie or something so the lighter color is better for them to hide from their predators so that keeps them you know uh, their population safer so if they happen to cross and happen to mate well maybe that if they blend that color um, or if you know all of a sudden the lighter squirrels now over in the darker area you know it's it's not going to be beneficial that lighter color is going to be seen by a predator and, and eaten up so those are breeding barriers they gave a story in here about these um, owls how they used to be more separate but now they're finding that some are mating together and having babies I'll have to ask my daughter she worked with some owls or maybe the so that's geographic um, temporal so if the breeding seasons are different I think there's a frog picture yeah so my daughter was saying that um, you know basically all these months you will hear frogs and at this time you know what we're here we're southern leopard frogs nope we're into the green frogs now <clears throat> so you would hear their mating calls right so we get several months of mating calls because they have different mating seasons. That's one reason they don't intermix, right? Um, the breeding seasons keep them apart. And then there's behavioral, so courtship rituals. So let's say these blue-footed boobies, yes, that is their name. Um, I looked up a video. It is kind of funny to watch them dance. Um, I can hook it up you know in, in the blackboard for you but uh so they do this dance so if they were able to mate with another kind of bird well let's say the the offspring of two different these two different species that actually could have an offspring um maybe they wouldn't know the dance right it's not it's it, the genes just didn't get passed on for that dance and so it wouldn't be beneficial anyway because they're not going to find a mate so they're not going to be able to um pass their genes on so sometimes the courtship rituals keep species separate because they just don't know you know they don't know their dances and then structural um i think that's literally means the structure of them of their because in your book well in my book here it shows different structures of flowers and how certain birds like the hummingbird or the butterflies or whatever will help pollinate those flowers are very structurally matching right and if you have so that's why you know we wouldn't have maybe butterflies it wouldn't if you mix their genes it's not going to have it's not going to suit any of the flower structures if their genes mix so it kind of keeps them separate oh here we go <clears throat> and then once in a while it's said that a tiger and a lion will find each other and get together out in wild and um and here we have a hybrid liger and then it was a tigus it depends on if oh well, here it is here it is here it is okay if the father is a lion and the mother is a tiger the offspring the offspring are ligers and they resemble a very large lion but with stripes um if the dad is a tiger and the mom is a lion, the offspring are more like a tiger and are called tigans. Male ligers and tigans are completely sterile, but the female counterpart is actually fertile, but they're still considered different species. Did you watch Tiger King? Good Lord. Anyway, that's what I think of now. It'll be years before I can erase thinking about tigers and not thinking about Tiger King. Ugh. Um... And then I think we are on the last part, uh, taxonomy. So basically, this is just the language in this particular science. There's got to be a way to classify things in every discipline, right? If you're a chef, you're classifying your kitchen, you're putting spices over there, putting spoons over there, ladles over there, I don't know. Um, you wouldn't just intermix them all, right? Um, auto mechanics, same thing, right? You, we have our organization. So in this science, we have taxonomy. We organize um, our you know as, as different organisms are found or studied they're classified in different ways so think about this though I think this is so cool wait hold on let me see um, 
from this here, just from the domain down to the species, it's really like you're getting into a more exclusive club the further you go, right? A domain, you're either prokaryote or eukaryote. Oh, tons of people fit into that. A kingdom, uh, well, we have a plant kingdom, but we have animal kingdom, so it's a little bit more exclusive. And then let's say you have animals with backbones, so chordata, um, a spine. So we're a little bit more exclusive. We're leaving out those worms and things. Um, and then we get to mammals, so just um, fur-bearing. It says warm-blooded, but it's actually endothermic animals, and they produce milk for their young. So the more you go down, the more exclusive you get, okay? And we are, the species that we are, that all humans are, are homo sapiens. And um, race, the idea of race is a social construct. It, it was human designed. Um, there's no biological difference uh, when it comes to different races, right? We obviously can um, mate with and produce viable young with any race. And um, so, yeah, but that's one argument that used to say that, that you know, biology separates us. Now, there may be certain, um, if you're from certain areas or have certain backgrounds, like you, your ancestors are from a certain area, you might be more prone to maybe a particular disease like they were talking about in here. Let's see if it says it. No. In here they were talking about, um, oh, what was it? What is that disease? It starts with an H. Huntington's disease. So they were talking about actually Huntington's disease. Um, people who have um, ancestors in, I want to say it was like Africana, but it's South, it's the people, the Dutch people who came to South Africa, they seem to, in that area, uh, have brought over um, Huntington's disease in their genes. And, you know, that um, the population of humans that was there, that was kind of, so I, if you're of Dutch descent from that area, yikes, what happens? You may have that, um, you know, be more prone to that disease. And there's another movie. So anyway, so yeah, race is a social construct that has nothing to do with biology. People designed race to be able to put humans in a hierarchy to say, we're better than you. We deserve more. We get to have more because we're more important. And it was all made up. Um, uh, it's super interesting. It was like the, in 1400s or something, but I read something about that. And yeah, so you in your lab are going to work on phylogenetic trees. And phylogenetic trees are basically just a hypothesis, right? Scientists are always trying to figure out how things are related, okay? Now, they used to only be able to look at the morphological, right? Um, so the physical traits of something, the phenotypes, what you see, how the body works, how the appendages work to try to relate things together um, or fossils based on fossils. So they could look at that as well. Now they can look at DNA. So it's been pretty amazing because some of the scientists are like, no, we should just depend on the DNA, you know, similarities. And others are like, well, wait, but their DNA might be very close, but look how different they are, look how different they look or behave. So, um, but if we take all that information in, we can actually kind of do a really good job in finding out um, when certain adaptations came about, right? When we went from gills to lungs, um, no backbone to backbone, from no hair or fur to having hair or fur, like when all those things came into play. So it's kind of like, I don't know, a roadmap from the past. What path did we take to get right here? So kind of cool. Um, I will put up some links for you of some cool videos. I think this is a super interesting topic. Um, you might be tired of it by now from my video, from the text, and from the lab. And um, I probably won't do this for the other chapters this week. But we will see. Have a good day. It's night for me now. I took all day doing this.